So we're gonna. I got a little message that the Lord put on my heart. I felt as though the Lord put this on my heart, and so this is where we're gonna go. Amen. Praise God. Let's see here if I can find my. All right, that wasn't what I wanted. All right. So hallelujah. Here we go. All right. So just real quick, I'm actually want to talk to you about. I'm going to call it the spirit of Jezebel. I'm going to, so we're going to reference Jezebel. We're going to reference her literal life to some extent. But I don't want you to think just about, je, just about the person of Jezebel. There's a lot of, and listen, I wanted to say this too. The Lord's kind of putting it on my heart to think this way. Whenever I use Jezebel, and especially whenever I'm using the spirit of Jezebel, I think we should all be on the same page with this. Or when we use, you know, if we call out a spirit of, if we use a name, like for instance, if I've been saying lately, I take authority over you, you use the lion spirit of Pharaoh. All right, because the Lord put down on my heart one time and I was thinking God's people want to be free to worship him. God's people want to be free to worship him, but Pharaoh, the spirit of Pharaoh, hold on, work with me now. The spirit of Pharaoh wants to hold God's people in bondage. When I take authority over the spirit of Pharaoh, I'm not necessarily thinking the literal. Now, Pharaoh, for all I know, might have been a Nephilim. He might have been one of them hybrids where his disembodied spirit's now floating around in the nether realm. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is this. Even if he wasn't, there was a spirit that was controlling him. Demon spirits didn't just show up in the, in the second temple period in the time frame but in those 400 years whenever God's prophets were silent. No. Demon spirits been here. They were trying to control Pharaoh. They were controlling Jezebel. They were controlling the prophets of Baal. And so what I'm trying to say is this, is that whenever we talk about a spirit of Jezebel or even if we saw that somebody maybe in a, an individual might have been operating in the spirit of Jezebel. Even if we call out a spirit of Jezebel, I'm not necessarily thinking that that person is demonically influenced by the actual spirit of Jezebel, even though maybe it's likely she had some of that weird stuff in her too. I'm talking about that hybrid genetics. It's a good possibility. But instead, for me anyway, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from. I'm using this as a more... Ad, like adjectives. Like when I can see Bible, work with me now, when I can see certain things in people's personality within the scriptures, I, got, I need you to understand that when they act in a certain way, they are types of evil. They are types that carry and teach us truths about what Satan wants to do, about what his workers of iniquity want to do. And I can just about guarantee you that every demon spirit you will ever encounter, to some extent, it has the adjective or the way that Jezebel acted connected to it. Okay, and, and, and in the end, that spirit, and listen, I can go on, I just want to be clear for the, for the women tonight. This isn't picking on women by any stretch of the imagination. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get into some of that. But what I want to say is because we can talk about the spirit of Amnon. Oh, really? Who's Amnon? Well, he's this brother who treated his little sister improperly. Okay. He acted like he loved her. He set that girl up and he took advantage of her and her virgin clothing, that garment that showed that she was a virgin and pure before the Lord. Listen, you think that they ain't got men in the church operating under a spirit of Amnon that want to destroy their sister? And listen, sometimes they don't even know they operate in that. Because it starts off as the spirit of lust. And people fall to a spirit of lust all the time. But the end result of that brother's little sister, after she's done with, and if the sin is found out, now her shame, her garment of purity that she received from the Lord Jesus Christ is ruined and it's stained and she's thrown out because the word of God says about Amnon that after that happened he hated her more than he loved her previously she was thrown out and the door was locked outside public disgrace so think about that brothers no you on the video because not people in here ain't going to be doing all that kind of stuff Hallelujah. But think about it on the video. If you got a spirit of lust and you're looking at your sister and you're thinking, oh, yeah, she's looking sweet. No, because see, in the end, it causes disgrace Amen. and it causes disgrace to the face of the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
And so I just wanted you to understand that whenever I'm talking about those kinds of things, that that's what I mean whenever I say spirit of Pharaoh, spirit of Jezebel. And again, look, let's just go on like this. I can almost promise you every demon spirit you encounter is going to want to act like Jezebel, going to want to act like Amnon, going to want to act like Pharaoh. Why? Because demon spirits have one plan and one purpose, and it's to try to mess up your walk, and it's to try to take control and to mess up your authority so that you can walk properly with the Lord. Amen? And so when we talk about Jezebel, I want you to see that this. I took this little screenshot. This is actually a modern-day Google map. I wanted you to... See this, um, well, my little thing didn't work. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is, this is a place called, Ta you know what, let me go back to this. I want to show you this. So, so on this map, where that, this is a, a Google map today, tires at the bottom, and where that pin is, it's called Sidon. All right, and you know, I just think that sometimes if we understand where we are, to the left is the Mediterranean Sea. I'm not going to get into it too much, but look, so this is Tyre, and Sidon is, 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 this whole area was known as Phoenicia, and this is a little bit of a blow up of it, and here's Tyre, and here's Sidon, and here's the area right here that encompasses it, and Phoenicia is the whole area. Now, there's some interesting things about the Phoenicians. Let me just go ahead. I'm not going to overdo this, I promise, but I want to give you a little bit of a background. And the reason I'm giving you a background geographically is because I want you to understand something. Once the works of evil, once the enemy takes control of an area, he ain't trying to let go. And listen, geographically, this is a very interesting concept. The main reason I wanted you to see this one, going back to this, is because you see Mount Hermon over there, Mount Hermon. This is the area where people believe the watcher angels descended and cohabited with the daughters of men. This is an area that's a hotbed of demonic activity. What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that when a demonic spirit or when the works of evil grab a hold of a territory, they don't want to let it go, whether it's geographically. Listen, that many scholars believe that at the foot of Mount Hermon is actually there was a there was a temple to Pan, and that that is actually where Jesus was, uh, where Jesus told uh, Peter, he says, "Whom do you say that I am?" Right, and he says, "You are the Son of the Living God." He said, "Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven." And he said, "Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it." On the very mountain, at the very spot, people believe that. Many archaeologists, smarter people than any of us in here, believe that that's what the context was right there. That they were literally near what they called the gates of hell at that time, and Jesus is letting them know, hey, Pan is not in control. Hallelujah. But I'm just letting you know that demonic spirits and territorial spirits don't want to let go. But in the name of Jesus, they don't have a choice but to let go because the power of him that is in us is greater than the power that is in the world. Amen. So, so that is, uh, again, where I wanted you to see this because that's where Jezebel was from. Jezebel was from this area known as Phoenicia. Now, you know, Mr. Billy, I think you would like this. Maybe other people that are fishermen, you might like this. People that are seafaring. Listen, the Phoenicians were seafaring people. Let's actually get into some history here, but you, I might bore you, and I don't want to bore you. But they were very, they, they had ships. They were about commerce. Let me just give you a couple of interesting concepts. Uh, so, so Tyre, the prince of Tyre, if you read in Ezekiel, I'm pretty sure it's chapter 27. I talked to y'all about it the other day. That is one of the, that's one of the places that Satan himself is described. Where it starts off talking about the prince of Tyre, and then it transitions into the entity behind the prince of Tyre. When it begins to describe that he was wisdom, and that there was merchant, that the, the ships were bringing merchandise all over the place. It's, it's where it talks about how, you know, the two of them, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel talk about the evil one and his, part of it is connected to this and there's also a connection in Revelation chapter 18 because when you read Revelation 18 and it says mystery Babylon one day is going to be destroyed it talks about the merchants it talks about the seafaring people it talks about how 
product was spread across gold and silver. And y'all heard me preach that message recently where I talked about that, that, that this is an enticement for the people of the world, right? And so I want, and then now another thing I'll tell you is because we were near Mount Hermon, I want you to know that again, this was a hotbed. Listen, there were Nephilim clan all up in here. If you go back and you read Joshua and you read Deuteronomy, actually Og of Bashan, where, the, where I believe the concept of the, king, the king's size bed comes from, all they, they were from this area. Yeah, maybe this, maybe you'll remember this a little bit better. Y'all remember hearing about the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter? There's a reason her daughter was demon possessed. Phoenicia, Syro, Sidon, Phoenicia. What is my point? My point is Jezebel was from this area. Her father was Ethbal, king of Sidon. Okay, he was king over this whole area. Josephus talks about him, but that's enough on Ethbal. That's enough on that. Uh, but I want you to know that there is a, uh, let, let's go ahead. Now, now this is, she, her, before her daddy murdered his brother, her daddy murdered his brother. So he was a murderer. He was a priest of Baal. And so Baal had a female consort. So Baal was a male God and he was known as the storm God. And he had a female consort named Asherah. All right. And, and so Asherah was known as the, what, the fertility goddess and known that she supposedly brought joy and happiness to people. Now, again, well, you know, everybody else is taking a nap. So this is an Asherah, this is an Asherah pole right here. All right. And so I want you to know that this, this right here, it represents fertility. Yeah, and that's what they would worship. Now, the re why would you put that on the screen? Because I want you to be able to see it. Look, they're all over the world. Yeah. They're all over the world. And uh, and so look, look at this. I was talking to Bill about this the other day because I think my brother's born Hawaiian. And I remember whenever I was in Hawaii, and one of the things my mom did when we spent the night, I still remember that, Mom. I don't know how old I was. We went to, we were in Honolulu. She wasn't about to bring me to the beach because she figured she was going to lose her kid. But we went to this little marketplace, and they were making totem poles. These things cross cultural boundaries. You need to understand that. How would you know such a thing? Because, see, at the Tower of Babel, Whenever the languages were split up, these concepts were spread over the world. Now, I want to share with you a little bit of scripture before we get into Jezebel right here. Deuteronomy 16, 21 through 22. Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God. Now, if I was going to let you open up your ESV version or another literal translation, look. It would, instead of grove, it would say a shearer. And in one of those, it, it, it would say, do not plant the, a tree as an a shira. And if you look it up in Strong's, what the, what the Strong scholars say is that they, they say that the, the grove is, tra is translated from the meaning of an a shira pole. So don't plant a tree and don't put up an a shira pole near the altar of of your God. Why would he say that? Because he knew where he was about to bring or what they were doing. Yeah. And now, and whenever we get into the time frame of Jezebel, we're looking at somewhere around 800, 700 BC. So we're looking at probably 500 years after Deuteronomy, 500 years after the Exodus. And the very thing that God warned them not to do, you're going to begin to see is exactly what the people of God started to do. So it also says this, where that, where that other word was, and also do not set up any image. Actually, it says in some of the other versions and in the Strong's, a pillar. Do not set up a sacred pillar. Now, I, I'm, one of the big things I want to make to you tonight is not only does Jezebel want to mess with individuals, really and truly, and I'm going to show you in the scripture, she really has a lust for the whole thing. She wants the whole thing. She's never going to be happy with just a little bit. All right. And so let's look at this pillar. See, I don't know if you can see them real well, but the one over there to the left is the one in Washington. And the one over here to the bottom of that is the one that's at the Vatican. I know you, you're not supposed to talk about that. Or, you, or no, I think you are supposed to talk about the truth. So that's the one in Washington. That's the one at the Vatican. I think the top one's in New York. And then the other one is in London. And so you see these images. 
What are they called? They're called obelisks. By the time it makes it to Egypt, they're called obelisks. But it's the same thing. It's a pillar. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, they call it a sacred image. They're all over the world. These things are all over the world. And we ignore it because we don't even know. Because it's so out in the front. It's so out in the open. We imagine in our mind that there's no way. There's no way on earth that somebody could be getting away with all of this. I was having a conversation with one of my bosses and I tried to explain to him a little bit about the Federal Reserve Bank. And whenever I said something about the Rothschild family, he like, because he's a very smart guy, he's very intellectual about world history or at least his version of it. And so I told him I was going to buy him a copy of this book that I read called Pawns in the Game that was written by a Canadian admiral. But because people don't believe that this kind of thing could be going on at this level right here as we speak. But I'm here to tell you that the spirit of Jezebel is not happy with just messing up your uh, individual life. So as we uh, so I want to I just want to make this point here that with the spirit of Jezebel, there's an alluring um, an alluring, seductive Spirit, she is connected to Jezebel, all right. And the result of her seduction is that she draws God's people away from Him. Ultimately, she wants to draw God's people away from Him and His truth. And as the spiritual blindness continues, the seductive spirit gains more power over the life of the believer. Now, you got to understand that she was an outsider from another culture, right? From believing in another practice of religion. And Ahab, as king of Israel, was equipped with the word of God to where he should have known not to go grab that woman and to marry her because the word of the Lord had already warned the children of Israel not to intermarry with them because he said they were going to draw their hearts away from him. Right. But because Ahab wanted to strengthen and make an alliance with the king up there, you see, there's another decision that sometimes we make because we think it's going to be better for us and we make these choices and we bring these things into our life and then we wonder why because we didn't really seek the Lord on it. We wonder why it results in chaos. We wonder why there's so much emotional turmoil that's going on. Right? And so... It, you know, the goal of the seduction, ultimately, I want you to know, is to dethrone the power of God at any level that it can. In the individual life, it wants to separate your heart from the Lord. She wants to separate your heart from the Lord. Uh, in the home, by removing the man's spiritual authority. Or can I be honest with you? The woman has some spiritual authority, too, in her own life to walk with the Lord. This, this demonic spirits want to remove your power and your ability to walk with God. I want you to get that point. It's not, this, is not a, this is not just for women this is, or about women. This is about men. This is about both of us. Amen? In the individual separating our heart from the Lord in the home, removing the man's spiritual authority. Because specifically, when a woman refuses to submit according to the word and the will of God, it causes a disruption in the home. So what are you saying, preacher? The woman just needs to know. I've already made it clear. I've already preached on that recently. A man is supposed to love his wife like Jesus loved the church. He laid his life down and he sacrificially loved her. Amen. But what, what if your husband's not sacrificially loving you? You still got to submit to the word of the Lord. Whether you like it or not, it doesn't work that way. Well, when he starts loving me like Jesus loved the church, I'll start submitting. No, it doesn't work that way. And vice versa. Well, she ain't submitting to me, so I ain't about to love her. No. Do you want the Holy Spirit moving in your life? Do you want the grace of God flowing in your life? Then you are obedient to the word of the Lord. To him that knows to do right but doesn't do it, to him... It is sin. To her, it is sin. Amen. That's right. Look, in the church, she wants to remove the, 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 the pastor's spiritual authority. The main purpose is to take the heart of the people away from God. And we know this because the word teaches us 
In 1 Kings 18 and 19, it says this. Prophets of Baal, 450. Prophets of the groves. I've already taught you what a grove is, right? Prophets of the groves, 400, which sat at Jezebel's tent. She comes down. She brings her lies with her. She introduces it into God's kingdom. She brings it into the palace. It starts to infiltrate all over the place. The spirit of Jezebel wants to take control of the spiritual authority that was given by God. I believe many times <coughs> we might look at a woman in the physical. We may say, oh, she's got a spirit of Jezebel. But I will say this. I, I, I honestly believe that most women, if they do have a spirit of Jezebel, are not purposely operating in the spirit of Jezebel. Like, now, I'm not saying it's impossible. There are some women in the world out there, um, and maybe they show up in churches, okay? Uh, maybe I've met one before, I can't think off the top of my head, that literally, they may not know they're operating in the spirit of Jezebel, but they know through seduction, through, a, through the power of lust, that they can ascertain or gain what they want in life. And so they purposefully throw that stuff on somebody, right? So that they can get what it is that they want. But I do not believe that most of the time when a woman is operating in this kind of a spirit that she necessarily automatically knows exactly what she's doing. I believe in that case, many times people are bound. They're bound spiritually and they're operating that way and they need freedom. They need the truth of the gospel to set them free. They need to be freed by the blood of the lamb. Amen. And so, look, whenever we get into Eve, for instance, Eve was, de Eve was deceived by the serpent. Amen. She was deceived by the serpent. And look, I, I wrote this uh, two nights ago because the Lord gave it to me because I know I sent a video out for y'all to watch. But, and, and I had this in my notes. Listen, Eve was deceived by the serpent. And that's what it, that's something that was said today though in that video I sent y'all on group text that that he tra he changed the word. He made people question the word. That's what the enemy does. If we don't know the word, many times that's the problem with many believers. They don't really know the word of God yet. Okay? Or they haven't spent time in the word of God to know. Or then if they do know the word of God, then they basically just disobey the word. But nevertheless, the Bible teaches us that Eve was deceived, right? And there's no plan. And so when she transgressed the word of the Lord spiritually, she took a spirit of rebellion into the inside of her, right? And whenever that happened, she received a lying spirit and her influence over Adam was used to steal Adam's positional authority. I want you to see that because listen, there's no question that Adam was weak. We know that. No question he wasn't acting like the positional man that he was given the authority to act under, that he was called by God to do. But let's not, let's not pit, I feel like this is kind of new for me right here. Let's not pit Eve against Adam, and let's not pit Adam against Eve in this story. Let's take a look, let's pull the curtain back, and let's look behind the curtain, and let's look at the entity that's behind it. And let's see what it is that he's trying to do. Because you see what he did was he used Eve to try to use, well not to try. He used Eve to usurp or to take away Adam's power and authority that was given to Adam by God. That's exactly what the serpent was doing because he wants to have the power that was given by God to this new creation, all right? So here it is. Jesus saw him fall like lightning to the earth. Here's a new heaven and a new earth. He sees the creation. He sees the dominion and power given to Adam, and he wants that. The closest proximity or the closest that he can get to this man is through the wife. Listen, your friends, your spouse, your children, they're so close to you. You have to guard your heart. Right. You have to guard your heart towards people. And listen, you got to understand that many times they may not even be trying to do that. Like they may not try to hurt you. But that's why when the Apostle Paul said that, look, in Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, 6, verse 12. As a matter of fact, I kind of like, I was looking at this earlier. I'm going to go to the Young's Literal Translation. 
I kind of like the way it said it because of the world rulers. Because we have not the wrestling with blood and flesh, but with principalities, with the authorities, with the world rulers of the darkness of this age, with the spiritual things of the evil in the heavenly places. So I want you to know that whenever you see people even in your life that are close to you and you feel as though they're driving a wedge between you and God, I promise you that many times they don't even really understand what they're right. doing. Whenever people rise up and they begin to act out in the flesh, when we become angry with one another, whenever we're hurtful to one another, if we're being, if we're under bondage by this, by these evil powers, then, then many times we don't even realize what we're doing. But that's why we need to understand that we don't war against flesh and blood. We're not in a wrestling ma match against flesh and blood, but it's against the spiritual wickedness that is behind it. But good news, we have power and authority as long as we're not allowing the serpent to get in there and to inject us with some of these things to pull us away, right, from the will of God. He's using her as a tool. He gains access to the delegated authority over God. Adam was God's co-regent upon the earth. And listen, in the New Testament, you and I are also co-regents. What's a co-regent? Like we're co-heirs. We're, we're, we're operating in royalty, man. You, you are royalty. The word of God says that you are kings and priests unto your God. I believe that. I believe that God has called us. We've got a portion of the anointing on this side. There's a whole lot more waiting for us on the other side. But I got good news for you. We have power and authority to walk in the spirit and the power of the Lord. Amen. Amen. The enemy wants to steal that from you. And he wants to lie to you. And he wants to believe you. He wants to make you believe that you don't have that power and authority. First Kings chapter, uh, let me go ahead and change this back to the King James. First Kings chapter 21, verse 25. First Kings 21, 25. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. So we see this concept of Jezebel. She's inciting it. And again, I want you to understand when I'm talking about this, we're talking about the spirit that's behind this and that and that the enemy is behind trying to influence to cause God's people because Ahab was called to be king over God's people. And she's inciting him. Is that I've never noticed that before. But look at that right there. He, he did. Look at that. He, it says he did sell himself. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like it's, I, I had a video series one time uh, by a guy named Joe Schimmel. They sold their soul for rock and roll, meaning that they sold their soul to the devil, right? Uh, G. Craig Lewis talks about it that, that in the hip hop industry. But I never noticed this before, that Ahab, it's almost like they're saying he sold himself over to wickedness. And Jezebel, his wife, stirred it up. Here's another scripture, 1 Kings chapter uh, 16, verse 25. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. And there's another scripture that says in, in 1 Kings chapter 16, 32 through 33, he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Ultimately, I want you to know this, and I've said it already, but I'm going to say it again. Its purpose, Jezebel's spirit, okay, its purpose is to gain control of power over the governments of the world. And ultimately, its purpose is to gain power over God's kingdom. That's what his plan is. Now, we know who wins in the end, but I'm here to tell you that the enemy, he's, he's not as convinced as you and I. He thinks he can win. Yeah. 
And I'm here to tell you that that's the spirit. The spirit of Jezebel will work at whatever level she can work. If she can work on you as an individual and mess up your walk with God and ruin your walk with God and steal your authority and leave you like Amnon did his little sister outside the door with the door locked, he's happy to do that. He wants to destroy you. He wants to make your life look, he wants you to look like a fool. But hallelujah, I got good news for you. He doesn't have the authority. If you won't let him have the authority, you have authority in Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Look at it, but I want you to see this. Yes. Because this, I'm not making this stuff up. This is Revelation 17. I want you to see. If this is a spirit behind this woman, and we should be able to see it in other places. To where, because even Jesus talked about Jezebel in the book of Revelation. All right, so let's just let's just go to this though. Revelation chapter 17, starting at verse 1. There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. So, what does many waters mean? It means she has control over people groups, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Isn't that something? How Ahab is a type of the king. I guarantee you, you can study Ahab out, and you'll find some types of antichrist in the earth. Ahab is a type of a king committing spiritual fornication against God, bringing this lying spirit into the house of God, into the kingdom of God. And this right here says that this whore, because that's not a real woman. This right here is not a real woman. How do you know that? Because she's riding the back of a scarlet colored beast. Look at it. It's got seven heads and ten horns. It's not a real woman. It's not a real, it's not a real, yes, it's a real dragon personified in Satan but and maybe one day who knows maybe one day people will see the dragon come out the water and they'll take off flying I don't know maybe that's what the Loch Ness monster was I don't know I'm not going to say it can't happen but what I'm saying is this is allegorical this is trying to teach us a type of the enemy right and look what it did she she says the whore that sits on the waters whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication but look at this and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. People are deceived. My friend. Listen to me. The church, much of the church is deceived. They don't realize. Most people don't even know that some of this stuff is going on right under their noses. And the bad thing is this, is that part of the plan, if you read through this, and we don't have time to read through it, if you read through chapter 17 right here, what you begin to realize is, is that this whore, this harlot, she's actually, it says she's the mother of harlots. So that means she was producing babies. The Lord showed me a long time ago that this mother of harlots has produced, it's basically Satan himself. Through all of his lying spirits. Whenever he showed up, I mean, I don't know if you're allowed to say this stuff on social media or not, but whenever he showed up and he told Mohammed, he presented himself as the angel Gabriel, and he told Mohammed about a new prophet, that he was going to be a new prophet and created a whole new religion. And same thing whenever he spoke to the Buddha, same thing when he spoke to Joseph Smith. Same, the Mormon, the person that started Mormonism. These people were not supposed to do the things that they did because the Apostle Paul warned them already that even if an angel comes preaching another gospel, let him be accursed. And yet people think, and listen, if I was the enemy, thank God, hallelujah, I'm not glad I'm not because he got a bad place for him. But that's what I would do. I tell people this all the time. Because not most of the people I talk to don't believe like me. And, and, and what I tell him is, is that if I was like him, if I worked for him, I think it's a good plan. You make a whole bunch of ways and you say every way leads to the center of the will. And anybody that says it doesn't is the enemy. Anybody that says there's only one way is the enemy. And they're the ones that are bad and they're the haters. They don't have love. And that's exactly what the spirit of Antichrist. Has, has prepared. And sadly, churches have bought in 
hook, line, and sinker. You don't love, preacher. You're not full of love. Oh, you, you speak of harsh things. Let me tell you something. People are going to lose their soul. People are going to lose their soul and they're going to, they're going to burn in a devil's hell. <laughs> and, and it's going to be people that were in churches. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Hallelujah. So I want, I want to show you some more about this spirit. And I've kind of talked to you a little bit about some of this before. But before I get going, I want you to notice, I feel like there's some, some flirtation going on in this story. And I, I just for the first time, I looked up the word flirtation. It says behavior intended to arouse sexual feelings or advances without emotional commitment. Okay. You got to be careful with flirtation. Yeah. I'm just telling you. Don't look. I've heard it said before. Somebody, I, you, you preach back, girls. I, I've heard it said before that if you don't want to be kissed, don't if you don't want to be kissed by the devil, then you shouldn't flirt with him, right? And that's interesting that I used the word kiss right there. But look, let's look at Proverbs chapter seven. I want you to see before I get there, wisdom and understanding. Solomon, King Solomon. This, I'm not going to get into him right now, but look. King Solomon wrote these Proverbs. He says in this proverb, he says, wisdom and understanding are the sisters, are, are the sister or kins, kinfolk of the people of God. All right. And the strange woman is the harlot that lurks in the dark. She's trying to seduce and entice God's people away from truth. Spirit of Jezebel, before Jezebel even lived, really, uh, it, 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 it's already going on and ultimately wants to destroy them. She, this Jezebel is the stranger in, the, in this story and she comes with seductive religious practices. She tries to make it look like it's God's involved in this. Okay. And, and so I want you to see as we read this. So, so here's, so here's Solomon and he's talking about keep the commandments, keep, keep your focus on the word of God Bind them up on your fingers. Keep them close to your heart. Look, verse 4. Say unto wisdom, you are my sister. Call understanding your kinswoman. That's like a relative. You know, I've never even really got along real good with my little sister through, through the years. I'm just being real with you. But I, I'm just going to recommend that you don't talk about me behind my back in front of my little sister. I can promise you that she got my back. I feel that with all of my heart. Her and I never really got along a whole lot growing up. But don't talk about her big brother behind his back. And listen, when it comes to wisdom being your sister, you know, wisdom is the word and the word is God and the word was God. Hallelujah. And the word became flesh. Oh, but why would Jesus be called, called a sister? Why would Jesus be called? Because Jesus is concerned like your sister would be concerned about you. And Jesus and his wisdom and his word is being compared and contrasted to the strange woman. The strange woman, she flatters with her words. And if you look up the word flattery, it's like smooth as oil. Oh, it sounds so good. Don't you like it when people tell you how good you are about something? Doesn't it? Yeah, you got to watch them. Jesus, the word of God says that Jesus didn't even, he didn't even pay attention to some of them people. Because you know why? Because he knew what was in the heart of folk. He knew what was in their heart. Yeah. I bet, kid, if I told you how many times somebody come up to me after I preach, man, that's the best preaching I ever heard. I'll be back next Sunday if I could keep, if I could get all of them people up in this house. We wouldn't have enough room. I, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, we'll see if you show up next Sunday. You know? Yeah. Hallelujah. I don't mean to be ugly. I'm just saying. But people want to flatter with their words, right? So he's looking out the window of his house, and he sees among the youths a man void of understanding. Listen, it's so important for you as Christians to stay in the Word of God. Amen? To stay in the Word and to let the Word of God become your new narrative of life, your new way of seeing the world around you. People don't like to spend time in the Word sometimes. People don't like to spend time in prayer. But listen, it's so important for our walk with God. Yes. So he's passing through the street near her corner and he goes the way to her house in the twilight. You know, twilight can either be when the sun's about to rise 
Or it could be when the sun's about to go down. Look at this. It tells us twilight of evening. So you know what that tells me right there? Every step he takes, he's walking closer to darkness. Because as he's walking towards our house, the sun's going down. And it's getting darker. As a matter of fact, it says in the black and the dark night, behold, there met him a woman. I'm going to tell you right now, this proverb is not about just sexual immorality. This proverb is not just about adultery. Adultery is bad. Don't do it. But this is talking about spiritual adultery. This is talking about the fact that God's people have been cheating on him since day one. The children of Israel have been cheating on the Lord. Okay, look, look what it says. With the attire of a harlot, and she's subtle of heart. It means that she's hiding her agenda. She's deceptive. That's the same adjective that's used to describe the enemy. He was the most subtle in the garden. Subtle of heart. She's now out in the streets. Look at this. She lies at wait at every corner. What you trying to say, preacher? There's a devil behind every bush. There's a devil behind every corner. Yeah. I don't believe there's a devil in every Christian, but I, I guarantee you there's a devil behind every corner because they're lurking and they're waiting and they're ready to trip you up, my friend, because the spirit of Jezebel wants to take away your authority because she wants to ruin you. And you know why? Because, yeah, I know she's got her sights. She's got her sights on the big picture. She's got her sights to, to conquer the world. But you know what you represent? You represent the voice of God. You represent the voice of God. You represent a voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare ye the way of the Lord. You represent the oracle of God. You represent the mouth of the prophet. And she wants to shut you up. And she wants to tie you up. She wants to shackle you. And she wants to prevent you from doing what the Lord has called you to do. So look what she did. She caught him and she kissed him. Now, what's crazy is, is that if you look at this word kiss in the original language, it says this. It says, number one, as a mode of attachment and also to equip with weapons. Wow. She not attached herself to this thing. That's why I was sharing with a couple of ladies a while back, probably a year ago. I was like, don't kiss that dude. I'm an adult woman. What are you talking about, preacher? Don't kiss that dude. Not unless you're ready to marry him. Not unless you, or not unless you will. How dare you tell me I am a grown woman not to kiss that man? You do whatever you want, boo. But look, if you ain't sure you want to be married to that man, I recommend you do like that, like that black lady told me a long time ago, that black grandma, when she said that the problem was is that they weren't supposed to be, they were supposed to be brother and sister before they ever became man and wife. That was the problem. They started kissing and touching, and then guess what they did? They invited some friends into the relationship, and next thing you know, they can't just get free. And now they over here, well, you know, now that we're talking about words. Well, let me, let me just, yeah, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to get into it. So here she goes. She lies around every corner. She kisses him with an impudent face. That means with boldness. She says this, I have peace offerings. How dare she talk about religion? She's talking about sacrifice. She's over here dressed up like a harlot. She ain't got no good plan for this man. She ain't trying to worship the Lord. She said, I paid my vows. Therefore, I come forth to meet you to diligently seek your face. We over here, we're supposed to be as the children of God, diligently seeking the face of our Lord. I want you to know that why you not, if you're not diligent, I know y'all are, we're going to diligently seek the Lord in a little bit. But if you're not diligently seeking the face of your Lord, Lord, help us, your people, because I can promise you one thing, the enemy's diligently seeking you. Yeah. That's what the word of God says. Yeah. Right. Look at this. She decked her bed with coverings of tapestry. What was that dude that made that pillow? What's his name? Yeah. Yes. He'd come out with some sheets. You know, he, you know what he said? I got the cotton from Egypt. Why? But look, even way back in the Bible. The Egyptian cotton, baby. Look, there it is. Fine linen of Egypt. And look what she did. She perf. I'm not trying to say them sheets are bad. That's not what I'm trying to say. That, that this cotton been, been around. All right? She says, I've perfumed my bed with myrrh. Look, myrrh's connected to dead folk, so that's a, that should have been a clue. Aloes and cinnamon. 
Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Go. Oh, let us solace ourselves with love. You know, the word solace means to bring peace, to bring happiness. Have you ever noticed? I remember whenever I was a young boy, teenage boy, and I meet something, I was like, man, that girl's cute. Boy, she looks, she is pretty. And then, and then this, as soon as I found out she might have thought I was cute, ooh, like my heart starts beating all of a sudden. It's almost like, I don't even know what you call that, but I got some kind of weird bump up in my brain, like some dopamine rush into my neurotransmitters and my synapses were firing on all cylinders. But guess what? That don't last forever. Come on. That don't last forever. As a matter of fact, that's why you really don't want to kiss somebody too quick. You don't want to try to wake him up before the appointed time. You really want to try to get to know somebody before you lock your lips on. I mean, is it okay for me to say this kind of stuff in public? Yeah, you want to be careful about that kind of thing because you don't even know, you don't even know if this dude really, it really loves the Lord. My sister, I, I told her, hallelujah, thank you, Robert. <laughs> uh, uh, my sister, well, I'm going to just say, she got on one of them, she met Chris on one of them Christian websites. And I love Chris. Hallelujah. But you know what the thing was with my sister? She said, I am not even believing this. I had a date with a music pastor. And he's like, well, everybody kind of tries it out before. She's like, excuse me? It, it, no, excuse me? Did you? No, not everybody tries it out before they get married. That, not the people of God. Not people that truly love the Lord. Right? And so there's so much of that kind of stuff out there uh, in, in the Christian world. People are just living loosely and acting like it's normal. No, that's not normal Christian behavior. Right, right? now they think that somebody like me is just an old, you know, old papa. You know, <laughs> like this old dude here. I mean, no. She says, come let us solace ourselves with love. She said, let us fill ourselves with this joy. That joy ain't gonna last. Look what she says, the good man is not at home. He's going on a long journey. I personally believe that this is the Lord. You know what the Lord told Philip? The Lord said, I'm going away to my father's house to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not tell you. But if I'm going away, I will also come back again. One of the things that I've known, I'm not proud to tell you this, Christian, but I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't. Even as a Christian, there's been times that I've been bound with sin. Bound with sin to the point where lust had my heart gripped and I was not free. And it was almost like the good man had gone on a long journey. Mm -hmm. And he was so far away. Yeah. The spirit of conviction wasn't really gripping my heart like it used to. And it was just so easy mm -hmm. to fall into the trap. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for his Thank grace yeah. and his mercy. I'm so thankful. I don't want to fall yeah. into that trap because let me tell you something, my friend. Look, look what she says with her much fair speech. She caused him to yield with the flattering of her lips. She forced him as an ox goes to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction. He, a dart strikes through his liver. We ain't talking about a liver shot. We're talking about a dart in your liver. Or the snare, like a bird in a snare. Can you imagine that? Like a bird that got caught in the trap or an animal in the trap. I never tried. I've heard some animals will actually chew their leg off in order to get out of the trap. You caught now, dude. <laughs> you caught. She gave smooth words to you. Demonic spirits made it look good, smell good. Now you take it free. Ah, and he's over there telling you he's got the right way. Watch it. And he's laughing at you. And he's laughing at your God. But I'm here to tell you the Lord wants to set you free. And if you start crying out to the Lord, and you start crying out in a broken heart, and you'll say, I got a broken and a contrite spirit, Lord. I don't want to be in bondage to this anymore. Set me free. He's going to open up that trap. He's going to let you go. And you know what's going to happen when he lets you go? You ain't going to want to get back up in that trap, buddy. You ain't going to want to get back up in there. Huh? Hallelujah. Hearken unto me now, therefore, you children, attend to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart decline to her ways. Go not astray to her paths. Many strong men have been slain by her. Look at this. Her house is the way to hell. Going down to the chambers of death. Dude, that sounds scary. I don't know about you, but I think I need to preach a message on hell. Dude, that sounds scary. I don't want to go to hell, my friend. 
Lily had sent a video the other day and I sent it to y'all. I don't know if y'all watched it, but you know what it was? That was so freaky. At first I thought it was kind of spoofy and I'm like, okay. What was so freaky was the finality of it. It's like, I know I preached a message recently and I said, the talk is over now. There comes a day, to how are you chance to talk on this side? The Lord would come to us and he'd say, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be made. Why is But now, the talk is over. Right? You made your choices. Help us, Lord. Now look at the opposite. Does not wisdom, that's your sister. She cries, understanding. She puts forth her voice. She stands in the top. Of the, of the city. She cries at the gates of the city. At the coming in at the doors. She says to the simple. Understand wisdom you fools. No be of an understanding heart. Here for I will speak excellent things. The opening of my lips. Shall be right things. She says there's nothing forward. Or crooked or perverse. In my words. Receive my instruction, not silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. How many times the things that the world has to offer start to draw us away? The word of the Lord says my wisdom, my instruction, my understanding, my knowledge is better than choice gold. Wisdom is better than rubies. All things that may be desired are not to be compared to her. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward or the crooked mouth I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. Man, wisdom has strength, church. The wisdom of the Lord has strength to impart to God's people. This scripture here, you know, I was going to share this with you right, right quick. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 22. I personally um, don't believe that this would have been a real woman named Jezebel. I can't prove it to you, and I don't think you can prove it to me. Okay. I just had a hard time believing that some church during the time frame whenever John is the apostle over the churches of Asia Minor, that they would have had a, a literal prophetess named Jezebel and they would have let her preach in the church. I could be wrong. But what, I'm, what I believe is that the Lord is allowing us to understand something. He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, Let's just take a quick second, because I'm almost done. Y'all just bear with me. Not too much longer. Let's take a quick second. So in old, in this time frame, whenever they would eat food sacrificed to idols, what, what that means is, is that they would actually allow that animal, they would pray over that animal to receive demon spirits. And then they would sacrifice the animal, and they would partake of it. Like they were actually taking into themselves demonic spirits just as you and i would say holy spirit fill us with your presence That's right right and so so what what he's saying here is that you she taught you to engage in demonic activity and you allowed it to happen so what I, my question was with that is that and y'all may not like some of this but how is it that much different when a church celebrates Halloween. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to ask a question. The night is the night of the dead. It's connected to the dead. It's connected to demonic spirits. It's connected to wickedness. And we're trying to like clothe it up and paint it up and make it look pretty. How is it that different whenever we celebrate Easter, okay, I understand. We, we've gotten in the habit of saying Easter. I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm just trying to make a point. It's the resurrection. How, I know the King James used the word Easter. That was, in my opinion, that was their bad. Okay, but how is it any different whenever we do Easter egg hunts, whenever it's the goddess Ishtar that the word Easter comes from, she was also a version of a Asherah, a fertility goddess. That's why they got bunnies that produce babies every 30 days. That's why the whole egg thing 
having to do with fertility. And it's a counterfeit hijack of the feasts of the Old Testament and the fact that Jesus died on Passover and was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. How is it any different whenever we engage the public and we allow Easter egg hunts and things of that nature? All right, so maybe I'm getting a little too far. How is it any different whenever we allow, we teach our children Santa Claus? No, hold on a second. Don't get mad at me, Jordan. It's okay, buddy. I'm just glad I that in. How is it any different Whenever we allow Santa Claus to take the place of Jesus. No, hold on. Don't get mad at me. Don't turn me off. Let me ask you a question. Whenever, whenever the commercialization of Christmas takes place and we're over here telling our children that Santa Claus gave them the gifts. When the word of God says the father of lights is the giver of gifts. Whenever we're taking away from Jesus and his, and his goodness, hallelujah, and his sacrifice, and the fact that the whole thing is supposed to be representative of when the angels sang that morning or that night, hallelujah, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, and instead of allowing, see, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't lost the, my, uh, my script, my thing went off, but listen, I personally believe that it's an anagram. What's an anagram? Satanic writing where they take letters and they change it up to hide what they're really doing. And I don't think it's Santa Claus. I think it's Satan's cause. Satan's cause. I think it's Satan's cause to take away from Jesus the glory that is due his name. That's my opinion. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to agree with it. It's okay. I'm a big boy. I don't expect everybody to agree with me. How is it any different if a preacher allows or does it never talk about secular music? Listen, I know that you may not agree with me on my position about that. I get it. But what, but listen, it's either, I'm either, it's either right or it's either, or it's wrong. And I understand that some people would say, yeah, but that's your opinion. All right. I, I just did because every now and then I'll check myself because I don't want to just get y'all mad for no reason. So I'm just, every now and then I'll check myself to see if maybe the secular music industry Changed since the last time I listened to secular music. So I did it. I, I looked up two songs, the number one songs that are out there right now. Okay, one of them was called Fast Car by Luke Combs. I don't know who this person is. Luke Combs or something like that. One of them was called Fast Car. Basically the story, I don't know if it's a man or a woman singing it, but basically the story is you got a fast car, get me out of here. My daddy, he never really worked. I had to Quit, mama died. I had to quit school to take care of my daddy. And so that's what I did because that's what I do. And you got a fast car. And, and look, you can get me out of here. And now we're, now we're in the car together and we're getting out of here. And guess what? Next thing you know, guess what happened? He done turned into her daddy. He done turned into her daddy. And so now she's saying, if I don't get up and get out of here, I'm going to die right here like I am. You're going to keep dying like that, boo. You know why? Because you ain't putting Jesus into your song. You ain't putting Jesus into your story. You're just going to keep on doing the same thing. You done married a man, and you got a generational curse on your backside. And I'm trying to tell you that the word of the Lord don't want you filling yourself full of that. Right. Oh, it ain't going to hurt me. Okay. Okay. Put that in you instead of holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you see what that does for you. All right. Now, here's the, here's the number one song today. Last night. I don't even think I can read them. Last night we let the liquor talk. I can't remember everything we said, but we said it all. You told me that you wish I was somebody you never met. But baby, baby, something's telling me. This ain't over yet. No way. It was our last night. And then I'll kiss your lips and all. Oh, yeah, I can't even read the rest of it. I mean, it's not. That's the point that I'm trying to make, though, dude. This is the world. This is the world. And preachers are scared to say this kind of thing from the pulpit because they're scared that their people are going to get angry with them. And I know because, listen, I used to struggle as a new Christian and I used to put the radio on. I used to do that, and I used to take trips down memory lane, that old classic rock and roll that I used to listen to, but I can promise you, whenever I was listening to, you know, 
uh, I'm on a highway to hell and all my friends are going to be there too. That wasn't helping my spirit, man. When I was used to listen to David Lee Roth and his screeching and I'm running with the devil, that wasn't helping my spirit, man. And I was thinking that that was cool. You know, crush a beer can on your head. No, there wasn't nothing cool about that because it was drawing me away from the truth of God's word. Hallelujah. And it wasn't allowing me to sanctify my spirit. God wants me to be separate from the world. And preachers that are unwilling to tell the truth are scared that people aren't going to show up next week. And they're not going to, but I'm here to help you. I want to help you to understand. And listen, whenever we disobey music ministry, y'all can come Whenever we disobey and we allow the influence of that into our life. See, if you listen to this old boy tell you it ain't over yet, baby, we drink some Jack Daniels. If you listen to that long enough, you might find yourself getting tempted to drink some Jack Daniels. You might find yourself in, a, in another inappropriate relationship. And whenever that happens, you know what you might find? You might find chaos in your life. No, you will find chaos in your life. And you will wonder, why is there so much chaos? And it's because we didn't run towards the Lord, and instead we ran towards the things of the world. Lord, help us. Amen? Amen.